Welcome to Nerds at Church, a podcast about nerdery and the Bible. I'm Pastor Emily, and I use pronouns like they, them, theirs. And I'm Pastor Kay, and my pronouns are she, her. In this episode, we'll discuss the second Sunday of Lent, which this year falls on February 28th. Check out the episode description for links to the Bible passages and other references we make in this episode. We do have a content notification for you this episode. We have a conversation during our gospel reading about genocide and the history of genocide. And also there is a brief discussion of domestic abuse. We would like to provide you with the National Domestic Violence Hotline, which you can call at any time at 1-800-799-SAFE. SAFE translates to 7233. Or you can find online at thehotline.org. For today's deep dive, we'll talk about covenants, which are a very popular theme throughout the season of Lent. We would have talked about them last week, but of course last week we had to talk about rainbows. Yay, rainbows! Indeed. But we promised you that we would talk more about covenants, so here we go. A covenant is what you might think of as a two-way promise, if it's between two people. A promise like, I will do this and you will do that. Or if there are more than two people involved, everyone in the covenant is making a promise to everybody else of some kind. They might not be exactly the same promises. When you're talking about a covenant, a covenant is not a conditional promise. It's not a, I will do this if you will do that. It's it's not a promise like, I will keep the peace as long as you don't, you know, do anything wrong. Uh, instead, a, a covenant is, I am going to do this and you are going to do that. It's much more certain than a conditional promise, hmm. you might say. And it's not necessarily only about or only involving the people involved in the covenant itself. It's not necessarily only about or only involving the people involved in the covenant itself. Like, for example, I will do this for you specifically, and you will do that for me specifically. It might also involve the surrounding community or, in fact, the entire world. I will do this for these people, and you will do that for these people. For example, it makes me think of in the original series of Star Trek, Spock and McCoy were two characters on the Starship Enterprise that both had very important jobs, and their jobs could occasionally overlap because Spock was the science officer and Dr. McCoy was the doctor. But they generally tried to stay out of each other's way because they didn't really get along that well. (laughs) They had a certain amount of respect for each other, and if the chips were down, they could work together very well. But if nobody's life was actively in danger, they tended to snipe at each other a lot. And so they had this sort of unspoken agreement to not get in each other's way. And that was for the good of the people on the Starship Enterprise, or the people that the Starship Enterprise was helping. So it seemed, I suppose, like it might have been a covenant just involving the two of them, but really it was a covenant that also involved everyone else that they were working with. Also, a covenant is not always necessarily entirely equal in terms of how much effort or work is going to be put in on the various sides. I'm going to keep talking about covenants as though they're between two people, just because that's the easiest way to explain them. If I keep explaining that all of them can have an infinite number of people involved, that's just going to take forever. Mm Mm-hmm. So a covenant might be, I will do this very, very, very simple thing, which is also incredibly vitally important to you, and you will provide these somewhat more complicated and more effort-involved services to me. Or a hero and a supervillain might have an agreement that if, say, they, the supervillain's sister lives in the hero's town, the hero might say, I will continue to do my work, and you as the supervillain will continue to do your work, but we're going to have to have an agreement that you, that I will not go after your sister in order to get, get to you, and I know that you're not going to do anything to hurt her, that sort of thing. That seems, like, unfair a little bit. Like, what about, like, including other people to, like, limit the work of the evil villain? So it's not just, like, the sister... Well, very often, if it's an unequal covenant, then the amount of power involved is also unequal. Like the super powerful person says, I will not smite you. And the non-powerful person says, and I will do these things for you in order to not be smited. Not all covenants are equal or perfect or even good. True. 
Also, another quirk of covenants is that they are not always entirely spoken, outlined, or indeed at all formal or formalized. You might have a covenant that's understood, say, with a coworker. I will handle this difficult customer who's always so rude to you, and you will take my turn cleaning the bathroom. But maybe you never actually say that out loud. Maybe it just sort of forms itself over time. Um, If anybody expects me to clean a bathroom, it better be spoken out loud. Well, it could be anything else, Sophie. It doesn't have to involve cleaning the bathroom. I am much happier to clean a bathroom than I am to, say, wash dishes. So uh, I would certainly have a deal what? going with... Can we please wear Cleaning bathroom stuff doesn't, doesn't bother me. I don't enjoy it, but, you know, you can wear gloves for that. Whereas cleaning dishes uh, is both icky and also winds up hurting my back every time. So I will a million times rather clean dishes than the bathroom. That is interesting. But yeah, we all have different lines. Uh, Actually, that's one of the ways that I have occasionally made brownie points with congregations in that if there's a cleanup day, I always volunteer immediately to help clean the bathroom because the brownie points you get for that are amazing. Hmm. And uh, it honestly takes 20 minutes and you're allowed to wear gloves, so I don't actually care. As opposed to washing windows, which can honestly like put me in pain for three days, depending on how windows, how many windows there are. I'm so good at washing glass. I could do that all day. Yeah, I'm fine with that, but my shoulders wind up hating me after about half an hour. When God is involved in a covenant, they tend to be pretty epic. Also, that might be an example of a covenant that is not entirely equal on both sides because God is so much more powerful. But an example of a covenant with God involved is I will be your God and you will be my people. Hmm. Not a terribly complicated one, although it does have some complicated after effects, I suppose. Or like last week, I will not kill all of you anymore. And in a flood, you will specifically. Be in a flood, specifically. And you will be my people. Yes. And also look, a rainbow. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine if God, presuming that the rainbow was in fact God's weapon of choice, Not sure how that, like, makes it into, like, a flood, because you're not sparing people. But can you imagine God having a rainbow bow, and, like, everybody that God hits with the arrow, it's, it's, like, Cupid, and everybody that God hits with the arrow turns queer. (laughs) Didn't we have that that idea in an episode of our previous incarnation of the podcast? I hope so. I hope so. Now we have I think you were delighted by it at the time. Yes. Brilliant. Brilliant. Although a rainbow as God's weapon would be involved in the flood if you separate it into a rain bow, a bow made of rain. A covenant can also be broken by anyone who's, the phrase in on it makes it sound a little weird, but anyone who's involved in the promise. If it's a promise between dozens and dozens and dozens of people, uh, just one person can break it. Uh, An example of a covenant that is made on a large scale with a bunch of people involved is the social contract, which is an idea that we have all made an unspoken promise to be somewhat good neighbors to each other, or at least not actively terrible neighbors, uh, in exchange for living in society together. Uh, And Hmm. one person can break that, and it's irritating. But the social contract doesn't seriously start getting broken until a few people, you know, get together and start breaking it together, mostly. Intriguing. Yeah, the social contract piece is, like, much more complicated because it's so There's a lot culturally to based yeah. and because it's so implicit and not explicit. There's a lot to it. Mm-hmm. Speaking of new covenants, yeah. our first reading for this episode is... Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and verses 15 through 16. God promises the elderly Abram and Sarai many descendants and changes their names as a sign of the promise or covenant. So an obvious theme here is name changes. Name changes are wonderful, and I am all in favor of normalizing name changes. Name changes is pretty obviously, a particularly important thing for people who are transgender. And a lot of us, though not all of us, find that the name by which we want to be called or the name with which we identify is not in fact the name assigned to us at birth. And so there's space to change names. And people frequently change last names when they get married. But also name changes as signs of life changes are important as well. So 
sometimes when people convert to a new religion, they take on a new name, a new interpretation of their name. Or Abram and Sarai become Abraham and Sarah. Which we'll get to in a minute. Yep. Jacob becomes Israel. I was thinking about it, and in An Ember in the Ashes, there are a lot of name changes that involve titles. So it's in the space where, like, titles are really important, and so you call people blood strike or soul catcher or those sorts of things but also the character that we know as elias who i mentioned last episode but he's one of the three main characters sure. grew up in tribe saif and so his name was ilias is how i pronounce it which is maybe not accurate but it's i-l-y-a-a-s and once he got to black cliff the place that he was kidnapped and taken kidnapped ish it kidnapped but within the like realm of what is acceptable in the empire and taken to black cliff yeah and taken to black cliff to train to be a mask one of the elite soldiers of the empire then his grandfather discovers that he exists because his mom had not told anybody that she had gotten pregnant and his grandfather changes his name to elias e-l-i-a-s And this one in particular, I think, is most similar to Abraham, Abram, and Sarah, Sarai, because it's it's very similar to his name. For the grandfather, it's just like marshalizing his name. But it's a shift in the name that marks a change in him, and he never goes back. He even has a conversation with his adopted mother about what she calls him, and she says, No, Ilias was the boy I raised. And you are now Elias, and that is, and like affirming that that is who he is, and that he is still part of her family, but that he is a different person yeah. than he was. Then, as we dive into the text, when we get to verse one, we read that when Abram was 99 years old, God appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Good lessons to learn. Just like Gandalf, it's never too late. For the next step in your journey. Oh, Because, you know, Gandalf is, like, super old when he becomes Gandalf the White instead of Gandalf the Grey. I haven't asked him his age. That's fair. He does mention some number of centuries or millennia. Yeah. In verse 3, we read, Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, And while this is usually imagined as Abram being reverent and humble and making an intentional choice as an act of worship sort of thing, I think it's equally respectful to the text to wonder if he just, you know, fell over. (laughs) I mean, you're 99 years old, you're having a quiet afternoon, and suddenly God pops up with no warning and starts talking (laughs) to you. I think it's fair to think that maybe he just fell over. I've started mm-hmm. listening to uh, not another D&D podcast recently, uh, which, by the way, is a podcast for grown-ups. And when they have a character who should be able to do something, but they're playing D&D and so the character rolls terribly so they couldn't do it, uh, often the excuse that they use is that they were distracted and they were looking at something else and then they got surprised and they fell over because it's a realistic option because this is something that really happens to people. And I think it works here. Maybe Abram just, you know, was distracted thinking about something else and God shows up and Abram fell over. Not terribly (laughs) dignified, but definitely a possibility. Truth. I have fallen over occasionally myself. In the next verse, we read, As for me, this is my covenant with you, God says. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I was thinking about the multitude of nations and ancestry, and a big piece of Battlestar Galactica, especially at the beginning, is how do we make humanity survive? Like, they have so few people, and it's just a question of survival. But it's also, in Battlestar Galactica, the 12 plus 1 colonies. There's, like, 12 colonies named after the constellations slash astrology signs, plus this one, like, theoretical colony that went to Earth. And so it's, in many ways, they are the ancestors of many nations because they used to be 13, like, the 13 colonies used to be, like, one group, and now they're 
13 colonies spread out, but also there's a like closing in and then a reopening that maybe could have been with last week's episode about Noah and the way that the flood is a closing in on how many people and then a reopening. But they have like numbers and they're keeping track of how many humans are alive so that they have a hope of reproducing enough to continue the species, which takes a lot of people to do so that they can be the ancestors of many nations and Cylons. It's complicated. Yeah. In verse 15, we hear God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife. So it's been 15 verses of Abraham and men and actually a lot of circumcision. (laughs) And God finally gets around to mentioning Sarah, who is kind of necessary to this whole process of being an ancestor of nations, you know? Sadly, this is actually a pretty good average for the Bible, which Mm -hmm. ignores women usually on a higher scale than this. 15 to 1 as an average would probably be better. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is where Granny Weatherwax from the Discworld would pop up and say, it's about time you brought her up. She's going to have to be involved, isn't she? Except, of course, in a British accent, which I'm not very good at. But Just because you're not good at it doesn't mean you can't try. I suppose that's true. She's also an elderly woman, and I don't want to make her comical. I do think it's interesting the like waiting and then finally mentioning Sarai because she is necessary to the process. And something that's interesting that I did not know is, so in Judaism, there is this mandate, if you will, to be fruitful and multiply, right? To have lots of kids. And when I was in seminary, we did clinical pastoral education, which is like chaplaincy work. And I did port chaplaincy. Most people do hospital chaplaincy. And my CPE partner was an open Orthodox Jewish rabbi. And so he and I got into like a lot of great conversations. And one of the things that he pointed out is that the mandate is for men to be fruitful and multiply, but that mandate is not for women. Like, yes, they can, and certainly it's encouraged, and there's an aspect of, like... Some women kind of usually have to be involved. Yeah. I mean, not necessarily if they're trans, but, like, there's an aspect of involvement, but it's very clear that the mandate is not for the person who would get pregnant, potentially, because there's so much more required of them than there is of the person who's providing the, se- the semen. So, yeah, it was just a really interesting, like... Excellent. Biblical nuances. Our second reading for this episode is from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. Paul uses Abraham's right relationship with God as an example of how God keeps God's promises. One of the themes in this passage is righteousness, or right relationship. So whenever you read righteousness in the Bible, you could also read it as being in right relationship. So it's not that you're perfect or that you do all the perfect things, but that you're in right relationship in some capacity. So Abraham's right relationship with God. And to expand on that a little more, Mm -hmm. being in right relationships means that you're fulfilling your role in that relationship. You're being a Mm -hmm. good child to your parent. You're being a good sibling to your sibling. You're being a good teacher to your students, that kind of thing. You're following through on the covenant that you made with yes, God, maybe. Yeah. And in so that was making me think, okay, let's be real. It wasn't making me think. I was already thinking about Ember and the Ashes. But throughout the series, Laia, who's one of the three, who's like the mainest of the main characters, the three main <laughs> characters, she's the most, she's the most important and wonderful. I'm a million percent biased, but that's okay. Yes. But she is, like, the main protagonist among the three protagonists. Kind of like Harry versus Harry, Hermione, and Ron. Yes. Except she actually is versus, like, the Harry, Hermione, Ron thing is, like, Hermione is, but Harry gets the credit for it. But that's a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Laia in the Ember in the Ashes series is the one character that is most solidly in right relationship with people. She is the righteous character. She does things and she has killed people. It like kills people in the books and all of that stuff. Like it's not that everything she does is good, but that throughout it all she 
is grounded in the what needs to happen to be in right relationship with people, with her people as scholars and representing her people and fighting for their freedom and their survival, but also in right relationship with other characters and how she supports them and how she allocates her own time and resources and self to resisting and to trying to protect the whole of humanity. Yeah. One of my favorite ways to illustrate right relationship and how it might mean different things in different situations uh, is my thoughts on the difference between being someone's pastor and being someone's friend. Uh, If I am a person's pastor and they break up with their long-term significant other, I will pay attention to them, I will listen to them, I will offer them uh, some kind of counsel uh, if that seems like something they'd be interested in, I will be a little gentler and and kinder Mm -hmm. to them and uh, offer them resources if necessary. As opposed to if I am their friend, I am very likely to immediately provide them with chocolate and probably a feel-good movie of some kind for Mm -hmm. us to watch together. Uh, I, I would want to spend more time with them. And very frequently I've found that part of my job as their friend involves the the plotting of horrible revenge that we don't actually carry through with but thinking about the possibilities is kind of fun Mm. but i wouldn't do that with someone if i was their pastor yeah because those relationships are different and being in right relationship in those kinds of relationships means different things Mm -hmm. and that's i think a piece of clarity that is more difficult the more socially connected we get on Facebook or yes in small communities to navigate the roles of relation of friendship and pastorship so like one of my really good friends is a teacher she also for a significant amount of time as a teacher was a fellow parishioner with her students right and so like navigating right. the relationship of when is she teacher and when is she fellow worshiper. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the time that comes with a a need for explicit acknowledgement around power. Right? There's a power differential between right. friend and pastor or teacher and student versus like people who worship in the same congregation together kind of thing. Right. Although even in that case if you're an adult and the other person is a kid there's still some I mean, yes. When we reach verse 14, we hear, If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. Okay, so I refuse on general principle to have a Reddit account because I know myself I will lose all of my free time there. But I do (laughs) occasionally look at the award threads for some of the subreddits uh, because those are usually highly entertaining and also don't require a huge time sink. So... One of my favorite examples of the awards that are given on Reddit are the awards from 2019 for the Best of AITA Awards. What does AITA mean? Am I the a-hole? We're we're not going to use the full word because that would get us an explicit rating. And one of the Best Comment Awards in 2019 went to a comment on a thread from a person asking... Am I wrong to be frustrated because my siblings got more money from our mom's will than I did? Although they did acknowledge in the post originally uh, that they were much more financially stable than their siblings were uh, and had been for a while for a variety of reasons. And the comment that won the award was, Your mom just told you one more time that she believes in you, kiddo. And we all promptly started weeping, right? (laughs) That's that's the correct response to have to that. That person was saying that no one here is being a jerk. Emotions are complicated. But ultimately speaking, it's not about law or money or capitalism, right? It's it's about family. In verse 16, we read, For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all Abraham's descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. This is a beautiful way of expanding who counts and how they count. Frequently I am cautious about what Paul writes when it comes to welcoming people who are (laughs) not Jewish, not followers of the law, 
into the community. Or just what Paul writes in general, but yeah. Or just what Paul writes in general. But particularly because it gets twisted and used to say, oh, Christians and not Jews. But that's not actually what Paul is saying. Paul is saying right. that through Christ, through faith, the promises given expand. And I think this is actually like part of Judaism is, right, the Genesis 12, you are blessed to be a blessing to many nations, not just to your own descendants. And so this is a different way of thinking about that, that is Christian and not Jewish, but that it is who counts and how expansive can we be. A lesson that pretty much almost every sci-fi or fantasy anything ever could learn a thing or two about. Yeah. Because we really, in the year 2021, heck, 50 years ago, but also in this particular year, we do not need to be saying man or mankind as if that's inclusive of everyone. It is not. You can say human, humanity, humankind. There are so many options. Please stop with the man and mankind. I don't know what it is. I was talking to Pace, who who will probably be a guest on this podcast in the future because they are doing a spin-off podcast that is in the works and will, you know, shout them out when it gets up and running. But just to awesome. like put in the back of your head. But Pace pointed out like so much it is like everything is like man, mankind. And that's part of why I love the Lord of the Rings quote of no man can kill me. I am no man, because it critiques that, and yet everything else still talks about the age of man. Yes. Also, it's been at least five minutes since you made a Lord of the Rings quote, so. It is true, and also it's been a little bit more than five minutes since I ranted about man and mankind, so I figured I'd That's bring that back up and remind people that I will still be ranting about it forever. Yes. In verse 18, though, On the flip side, kind of, we read, hoping against hope, Abraham believed. And that is basically the, like, some aspect of the narrative arc of think every superhero ever. That at some point there's, like, some sort of hopelessness and they hope against hope. It's an ongoing theme of the Ember and the Ashes series, too, where you think things are bad and then they get worse. And it's, like, all you have left in some respects is hope. Or Aragorn, who is, his name is Hope. Yeah. In verse 19, we hear, uh, Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Paul. (laughs) Ageism. Tisk. Not only did Abraham live to raise Isaac, but he also married again and had at least another, if not a couple more kids with his next wife after Sarah died. I don't think he would have said he was as good instead at this point in his life. I don't know. I feel like he kind of did a little. Like, they hinted at it. Well, he, he was wrong, but... Right. Let's let's not diss being old in general, also. Don't oh, dismiss no, totally the elderly. Agree. Any pastor can tell you that that's dangerous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and also, I think somebody needs to yeah, watch yeah. the movie Red, which came out a few years ago now and was a very fun action spy thriller movie starring Bruce Willis, John Malkovich, and Helen Mirren. Uh, Hmm. Helen Mirren was particularly spectacular uh, as retired spies who come out of retirement briefly uh, to do some important work. And just because they're elderly doesn't mean they can't still do their jobs. There is also a fantastic story of the shooting of that movie where uh, Helen Mirren uh, had to shoot a machine gun at one point in one scene. And she had never done that before, although she's done, uh, I believe, uh, quite a few action movies. And so the people training her on it warned her that there was one heck of a recoil and she wanted to be careful of it. And apparently she had absolutely no trouble with it at all. Just immediately was doing just fine on the range. Of course not. Of course. Yeah. I saw previews for that and wasn't sure if it would be good or not. It was a surprisingly fun time. Like, you can also tell that, I mean, it's not just the three of them, but they are all clearly having a grand old time and are also willing to make fun of themselves to an extent. Mm-hmm. And it's it's pretty fun. Also, Bruce Willis, Helen Mirren, and John Malkovich is kind of an unusual combination in itself. Yeah. Yeah, it was really interesting. 
Maybe I'll have to see if I can track it down and watch it. I should mention I have not read the comic, which I understand is hugely more violent than the movie was. Huh. The, the movie was like normal action movie violence. The comic apparently goes way past that. Good to know. Our gospel reading for this episode is Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Peter rejects the idea that Jesus will have to suffer, and Jesus rebukes him. Jesus invites his followers to take up their crosses. So one of the themes in this passage is sacrifice. Right? When Jesus is talking about taking up their cross, it is not a dealing with suffering that somebody else imposes on you, but a, a willingness to take on the suffering of others, to take on and use right. privilege, to sacrifice your own privilege for the sake of others, even potentially to the point of death. And this reminding me, spoilers if you haven't read the Divergent series, but if you haven't, it's been out for a while, so. But in the Divergent series, Triss, the main character, is frequently, like, risking herself for others, but then at the end, she actually sacrifices herself for everybody else, which I was so, so mad about this ending because I really liked a lot of the books. And there was a strong woman protagonist, which I love. And yes. then they killed her at the end. And it's just like, come on now. we got to stop killing the women who are strong. Like, that's not helpful for, our, for like, the psyches of anyone to assume right. that strong women get killed. But Spoilers. A number of people felt the same way about Natasha Romanoff in the MCU. She also sacrifices herself. Also, she doesn't get a funeral. Which rude. seems kind of rude. Yeah, super rude. When we reach verse 32, we hear, And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. I've always had a little trouble imagining this, like the urge to do that when Jesus is your teacher. I just, I, I'm thinking it would be like if Harry Potter tried to take Professor McGonagall aside and correct her on a point of transfiguration. Like, <laughs> that's the level of of sheer arrogance you have to have to be able to try to pull that off. Yeah. I, well, and just... Harry, like, pushes back and, like, rebukes on a variety of things, but doing it on the subject matter that that person teaches is, like, yeah. Right. Like, he doesn't try to correct Snape about potions. Like, he's not that. Yeah. No. You know? It, yeah. Yeah. In the next verse, in verse 33, we read, But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter. And it reminded me of one of the characters on Battlestar Galactica, Hilo. So there are some spoilers here if you haven't been further in on Battlestar Galactica. But Hilo is in a relationship with someone who is a Cylon. There's a story arc of how it happens in the first season. But he becomes this moral, moral voice in the show... And so he is the one who, who rebukes others, more like Jesus rebuking Peter in the sense of he actually is right about what he's doing, yeah. but also very much in the, like, Peter rebuking Jesus in the, he's rebuking, like, the president and the admiral who's in charge <laughs> of the entire military. Yeah. But he rebukes them because they're thinking about genocide, and he's like, no, this is, this takes away our humanity, like, this is inhuman. And we know yeah. that genocide is actually against, like, on this planet, <laughs> genocide is against our agreements around war. And so that, like, we're with Hilo on it. But it is a thing that humans do, but that isn't what makes us humane, you might say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a thing that humans do. And also, it's a thing that we shouldn't do. And we and we've done it in this country I mean, since, so many times. since the beginning of white people being here, but also when we perform hysterectomies on people in detention centers, that is yeah. genocide. Yeah. And speaking of Battlestar Galactica and Hilo, in the next verse, verse 34, Jesus calls the crowd with the disciples and says to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And this is actually something that Athena, who is in a relationship with Hilo, does during the show. 
the course of the show that she in so many ways denies her Cylon self for the sake of humanity and humans in order to support and become a part of humanity. This is not quite the same as what Jesus is talking about in that Jesus doesn't actually want us to like literally deny who we are. Jesus is not advertising to go back in the closet or to stay in the closet, recognizing that being in out of the closet is a false binary and a complicated thing. But like generally she's not saying like pretend like you're not gay to make everybody else feel a little bit less uncomfortable about their own queer phobia. Right. Jesus is talking about taking on the burdens of others. Jesus is also, because whenever this passage comes up, I always feel like we need to have a PSA. Jesus is also not talking about staying in an abusive relationship. That yes, is not. That is correct. Jesus is not talking about that. That is not what it means to bear your cross, period. Not at all. When we reach verse 35, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Or to unpack that a little bit, uh, because a lot of people hear that and have no idea what the heck is going on. If you get overly concerned with your mortal life, you might lose your eternal life. But those who lose their mortal life for Christ's sake gain their eternal life. And this reminds me of Jupiter ascending. Near the end, Jupiter is given the option to save her family, but if she does it the way that it's presented to her, everyone on Earth will be killed at some point very quickly after she dies. Mm -hmm. And she realizes that by saving her relatives, her family, she will lose her larger family, humanity. Mm -hmm. And she decides not to take that choice, which is not a perfect parallel, but it's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Catch us next time when we'll discuss nerdery connections to the scripture readings for the third Sunday of Lent with our special guest, Russell Brayman. This podcast has been produced by us, Kay Roloff and Emily Ewing. For more fun, check us out on Twitter and Facebook at N-E-R-D-S-A-T-C-H-U-R-C-H or contact us at nerdsatchurch at gmail.com. Also, if you like what you've heard, rate us or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts Facebook, or wherever you catch your podcasts, including the Our Bible app. If you appreciate what we do or want to get actual transcripts of the podcast episodes, consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerds at church. We hope Patreon can help us get our episodes transcribed for those who need or prefer that. Though if you want to help us with transcripts, let us know via email or social media. As the ancient Christian said, Pax Bobiscum. Bobiscum.